Hey, welcome everybody to the Wisconsin Historical Society's latest installment of Book Bites. Today, we'll be celebrating the world-renowned motorsports race course, Road America, and the man responsible for its inception, Cliff Tufty. Now, our discussion is anchored in the research I conducted for my article, Mr. Road America, how Cliff Tufty changed the course of road racing history, which is available exclusively through the Wisconsin Historical Society and its magazine of history. And the only way you can receive the magazine on a quarterly basis is through your membership to the Wisconsin Historical Society. Speaking of which, I would be remiss if I did not mention that the article about Cliff Tufty and Road America would not have been possible if not for the generosity of the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, Wisconsin's oldest and most trusted publisher. And I can't say enough great things about the press along with the whole Wisconsin Historical Society is accomplishing in its daily efforts to preserve every aspect of the state's rich and cultured history. Your membership directly supports those efforts. So I encourage you to visit the society's website located at the bottom of this presentation anytime during this presentation to learn more and to also sign up for a membership if you haven't already. And before we get too much further, uh, I wanted to take a moment and let you know to feel free to send along any questions in the chat and we will try to answer as many of them as possible when my presentation has concluded. So, a little about me. My name is William Pavletic. And not only have I been a proud member of the Wisconsin Historical Society for two decades, I've also had the privilege of collaborating alongside dozens of dedicated individuals of the Wisconsin Historical Society Press during that time. Together, we've published great stories about the Milwaukee Braves, the Green Bay Packers, world famous entertainer Liberace, industrial designer, and the iconic uh, designer of the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, Brooke Stevens, and the rich history of surfing on Lake Michigan in Sheboygan, all of which are available for purchase online at the Wisconsin Historical Society shop or wherever fine books are sold. But enough about us, it's time to get behind the wheel, rev up the engine and put the pedal to the metal. Road America is one of the world's preeminent race courses situated on 600 and 40 acres of lush Kettle Moraine scenery between Milwaukee and Green Bay. It's only one of a handful of road circuits in the world maintaining its original configuration of 4.048 miles, including 14 unique turns. The track also features many elevation changes, along with a long front stretch where speeds approach 200 miles per hour. Since it opened, in 1955, Road America has hosted countless race legends, champions, and celebrities, both as spectators and behind the wheel. Now, Road America has also hosted races from all the major sanctioning bodies, such as CART, NASCAR, IndyCar, Moto America, Can-Am, the United Sports Car Racing Series, the Pirelli World Challenge, and numerous Sports Car Club of America events. Now it's also a great place to watch a race as Road America's open seating allows spectators to venture throughout the grounds. Grandstands are located in several areas as well as permanent hillside seating where there's always room for one more as crowds of over 150,000 can be accommodated on a race day. Now, if you've ever had the pleasure of visiting Road America, you may have passed by this bronze statue that greets you uh, by the paddock area on race day. It's a statue of Cliff Tufty, and it was sculpted by Wisconsin artist Tom Holleran. And the statue immortalizes the trailblazer whose foresight and determination transformed a quiet tourist town into an international race mecca. Inscribed on a nearby bench is a quote from the 1955 edition of the Chicago Region Sports Car Club of America publication, Piston Patter, and it states, let there be no mistake, when the record of Road America is written into the history of sports car racing, one name will stand alone, 
Although he sought and received help from any qualified source, he and he alone had the vision, courage, and the ability to carry out the construction of a superb course. While the rest of us talked, he built the man, Cliff Tufty. Now, Tufty was a dreamer, the Walt Disney of American road courses. He built it and they came, the drivers, the car companies, the sponsors, and the fans. Today, his four miles that go nowhere is celebrated as one of the greatest racetracks in the world. But Tufty endured numerous twists, turns, and bumps as he made Road America into a reality. Now our story starts in Elkhart Lake and Elkhart Lake's rich road racing history began long before the arrival of Road America. In the years that followed World War II, Americans went crazy for cars, the faster the better. Caught up in the frenzy, a small group of motoring enthusiasts known as the Sports Car Club of America staged the Watkin Glen's Grand Prix on October 2nd, 1948. In the seminal event from which all road racing in America can be traced, the first open road race of its kind ran through the streets and hills of Watkins Glen in upstate New York, which kicked off the country's obsession with road racing. And when the phenomenon reached the Midwest, the Chicago region of the SCAA headed north, their members eager to stage a race over Wisconsin's less populated country back roads. And Elkhart Lake was happy to entertain them. By 1949, the village, located about 60 miles north of Milwaukee, was in economic trouble. A canning factory had shut down, the tourism numbers had dropped, and the resorts were struggling. Community leaders were desperate for new revenue. And sensing an opportunity, a group of local boosters led by Ollie Siebkin Moeller, matriarch of the Siebkin family and owner of Siebkin's Holiday Resort, which still resides in its original place in Elkhart Lake, along with Jim Johnson, then president of the Elkhart Lake Bank, agreed to host an open road race in July of 1950. Now, James Kimberly, who owned Kimberly Clark in nearby Nina, helped lay out the first race circuit based on those he had seen in Europe. And as word of mouth spread of the upcoming race in Alcart Lake, hotels booked up. Only one obstacle remained, an obscure state law that allowed any citizen with property along a public highway to appeal to the governor to maintain open access. Luckily, no one brought up the law. So on July 23rd, 1950, six featured races were held, including an exclusive race for female drivers, running on a 3.35 mile course northwest of Elkhart Lake along counties, highways P, J, and Z. Although it had very little advanced publicity, the race hosted upwards of 5,000 spectators and James Kimberly driving a Ferrari won the featured race. And what's really cool is that 1950 race along with all the colorful participants and excitement can be retraced and relived throughout a series of historical markers placed throughout the original route, which I actually drove this summer and it was a lot of fun. Now, the 1951 race was built on the success of the July races in 1950. The Chicago region of the SCCA raised the bar the next year by attracting celebrities and professional race trains from across the country. Race organizers, afraid that an uncooperative citizen might sabotage the race by appealing to, the property, by appealing to that property law mentioned the previous year, reached out to the governor for assistance. Now, Walter, Walter Kohler, a Sheboygan native who owned a cottage on Elkhart Lake, agreed to stay away from his office during the two weeks leading up to the 1951 road race to avoid any conflicts of interest. Nationwide publicity prompted an estimated 50,000 people to line the streets on August 26, 1951, to watch the racers compete on an expanded 6.5 mile course that encircled the entire lake. While 1950 had been mainly a race put on by and for the enjoyment of racing buddies, the 1951 race was of national importance. And now according to motorsports motor historians, the 1951 race, which was won by John Fitch, put Elkhart Lake on the racing map.
Now, the 1952 racing weekend attracted more than 100,000 spectators and brought welcome dollars to the local economy. Like the previous year, drivers man maneuvered through the village itself with no nothing separating them from spectators waving from their porches or standing along the course except hay bales and snow fences. And John Fitch repeated his champion in the featured Kimberly Cup race but a dark cloud of controversy followed the races. Just days after the Elkhart Lake races, an errant racer at Watkins Glen plowed into a crowd of, a, uh, an errant racer at Watkins Glen plowed into a crowd on the sidelines. 12 people were injured and a seven-year-old boy was killed. The tragedy gained nationwide prominence and prompted Wisconsin lawmakers to ban road racing on open roads in 1953, deflating any hope for future races on Sheboygan County roads. The Elkhart Lake race organizers shifted their focus toward a building, race organizers shifted their focus toward building a closed course near, near the village. As early as 1952, they had created a map with several possible configurations but the plans came to nothing. All the ideal locations were privately owned and purchasing the land would have been too cost prohibitive. Having exhausted their options, race organizers believed Elkhart Lake and its 450 acre spring fed lake would return to being a quiet tourist town, once known for hosting spectacular races once upon a time. But one local Elkhart Lake resident refused to accept Elkhart Lake's fate. Cliff Tufty. He understood the economic impact racing had on his adopted hometown, so he set out to change its destiny. Tufty was no stranger to racing. He'd been a devoted supporter of the Elkhart Lake road races from the beginning, despite his sense that public road races would have a short shelf life. Tufty was tenacious and inquisitive, characteristics that helped him in his humble beginnings and, grow, and his growth into a successful career uh, within the roadwork and bridge building world. Now, after graduating from the Platteville School of Mines with a degree in civil engineering, he served with the Army Corps of Engineers and then worked for state highway commissions. In 1929, the Elkhart Lake Sand and Gravel Company, a major supplier of highway and railroad ballast in Eastern Wisconsin, hired Tufty. By 1950, he was its major shareholder and company president. As early as the spring of 1952, Tufty started combing the Sheboygan countryside. He trudged over the near, nearby kettles and moraines, the depressions and hills created by glaciers thousands of years before, all in an effort to visualize a permanent road course. The odds were against them. At the time, there simply were no purpose-built road racing courses in the country. No one in the world had ever done such a thing. Tufty had no mechanical guidelines to help him, only his innate engineering skills. From the outset, Tufty relied on his experience as a highway engineer while searching for the perfect space and terrain to build a permanent course. Now, Tufty focused on a stretch of land two miles southeast of the village where his company, Elkhart Sand and Gravel, owned 495 acres of undeveloped land. He also purchased the adjacent farms to complete his larger footprint for the racetrack. Tufty's engineering expertise, combined with his firsthand knowledge of the land's contours and terrain, allowed him to visualize a course where no paths existed before. He drove around the neighboring county roads and selected those curves and corners that appealed to him. He then measured them and had them duplicated in his track. After countless days spent hiking through the clinging brush, low hanging branches, and around glacial boulders, he staked out a race course that would embody the spirit of the street races that inspired it. After identifying the ideal location for his privately owned course, Tufty turned to financing the project. He estimated the build would cost approximately $175,000. In January of 1954, at an initial organizational meeting at the Seedkins Hotel, Tufty secured the cooperation of State Senator Al Lown of nearby Keel, and Lown proposed that the original boosters in attendance, including Ed 
Leverence, a golf course operator, the senator's brother, John Lown, a furniture manufacturer, Everett Nemitz, a hardware store owner, and Ollie Seedkin Moeller pledged stock purchases to ensure the project could get underway. Cliff had a real selflessness about him. He knew how to engage people from every walk of life and get them to believe in his dream. And the community responded, offering enthusiastic support for his vision and local boosters and C SCCA members, most of whom lived in and around Chicago, purchased the necessary shares. Such leaps of faith weren't uncommon in Wisconsin during the 1950s, which was the same decade where Wisconsin witnessed Milwaukee building a stadium on speculation in hopes of luring a major league franchise, which it did with the Braves in 1953, and Green Bay constructing the first publicly financed football stadium for the Packers in 1957. Road America benefited from having an engineer as its designer. Before a shovel full of earth was turned, Tufty asked a handful of veteran Chicago region SCCA members to consult on his plans. In April of 1955, Tufty escorted the group across grassy woodlands and gravel pits, showing them a crude layout of flag stakes that provided a rough indication of the direction the track would take. His presentation earned their approval to begin construction. It also secured Road America's first sanctioned race as the SCCA granted the Chicago region a national listing for races for the weekend of September 10th and 11th. Tufty had just five months to complete his track. And he did not waste any time. That month, bulldozers carved the first swaths into moraines that had remained untouched for thousands of years. Against such an ambitious schedule, Tufty relied heavily on his builders, led by Harvey Fisher, Pete Blatai, Harold Mentick, Stanley Coleman, and others to construct his vision. Tufty was equally fortunate in the men who signed on to build the course as they were caught up in the once in a lifetime spirit of the project. And by Labor Day weekend with Road America's inaugural event a week away, a palpable excitement buzzed throughout Elkhart Lake. Drivers began arriving as early as Wednesday with more than 190 of the nation's top drivers slated to race during the weekend. Tufty and the construction teams were lucky because the summer was unusually hot and dry, but they were still racing the construction deadline up to the last minute. And as Tufty recalled, quote, everybody who could lend us a hand did, and we just pounded the last nails into the pagoda on the day of the race. But Tufty and his, and his team did it. That first weekend hosting races was a resounding success for Road America, and the rest as they say, is history. And since that inaugural race on September 10th, 1955, Road America has evolved into a year-round venue. It now hosts more than 500 events annually, attracts over 800,000 visitors annually, and generates over $134 million into the local economy annually. And Road America is an elite company as one of Wisconsin's largest ge revenue generators alongside the likes of the Green Bay Packers, Milwaukee Summerfest, and the Experimental Aircraft Association's Air Venture over, over Oshkosh. So that concludes our presentation. So if we have any questions, we would love to hear from you. And I will answer as many as I can. Uh, Eric asks, why were there, asks why more racetracks were not developed elsewhere in Wisconsin or the United States? Well, I don't have the specific answer on that, but I can tell you there were other road courses built throughout Wisconsin, like State Fairgrounds uh, in West Dallas, and also I believe a racetrack outside of Madison. But what made Cliff Tufty's track unique was as soon as it was built, it was it was state of the art, which then attracted the international racing circuit. And we have another question from a Stephen in Cameron, Wisconsin. 
he asks, what's so unique about Cliff Tufty's track layout? And I can tell you that Road America benefited from having an engineer as its designer. And compared to the conventional ovals used for auto racing at the time, Tufty's track design was beyond innovative. So Eric, this kind of ties into your question. Uh, Road America incorporates calculated curves, fast straightaways, tricky grades, and swift descents, all within a series of terrain combinations throughout its entire length with no two the same. And Tufty laid out the loop in the shape of a boot with a sharp bend at the ankle and its elevation variation of 175 feet measured from the highest point near the starters platform to the lowest at corner 12. And Tufty used a specialized custom black topping surface 27 feet wide, which was laid atop a gravel base ranging anywhere from one to two feet deep. And his custom hot mix prevented softening of the surface on days of extreme heat. And it also made for a favorable surface on race days. For expert drivers, the wider track and superior surface eliminated no passing zones, allowing cars to run side by side and making for more exciting and interesting races. And at the time, a lot of the race tracks, especially in America, were dirt tracks. And for the tracks that were more of a permanent base of, you know, having a hard surface, that really drove up, you know, construction costs. And Tufty and the Elkhart Lake boosters really benefited from being able to buy the land cheap from the Elkhart uh, Sand and Gravel Company and keep costs down because ultimately the budget for the prod for the entire construction of Road America was $175,000. But if they would have had to have paid traditional prices and not had the help of the local community with labor and materials and rentals, it very easily could have exceeded over a half a million dollars, which was an exorbitant cost for a racetrack in the mid 1950s. Any other questions? Uh, TG asks, is the circuit still owned by the shareholders? And I can answer that as yes. Um, the shareholders are passed down through family members, many of whom have ties to the Chicago region of the SCCA and uh, the Elkhart Lake community. So it's still, it's still privately owned and it is still, I would say community-based, community-based as far as the, the local racing community and the Elkhart Lake area, all of whom, you know, really, really were instrumental in securing the early success of Road America. All right, well, looks like uh, we are all questioned out. So I just wanted to personally thank you for um, attending this book bite. And before I go, uh, one last time, I would encourage you to visit the Wisconsin Historical Society website, wisconsinhistory.org, and uh, to learn more about the press and the organization as a whole, and to sign up for the magazine. and um, also, just just take a deep dive and lean into everything that's great about Wisconsin, because there are a lot of hidden gems within our state that the organization celebrates and cherishes and has archived. So with no further ado, I want to thank you all for participating and uh, hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.